So I'm growing in uh, learning how to title messages and make slides and do things like that. So in case you wondered what today was about, there you go. <laughs> today we are talking about union. I'm going to, my reference got messed up really quick, so I'm going to pull this up. But while I'm pulling this up, how many of you guys are church history nerds or church history buffs, I should say? There'll be like a couple, couple hands that go up. Um, and how many of you guys to uh, just pull from different backgrounds? How many of you guys grew up like uh, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, or at least sort of around that? Just a couple. Okay, I would have expected that to be higher, but wouldn't be the first time I'm wrong. So I'm going to introduce you very briefly to somebody uh, from church history who was very important, named Saint Athanasius. Uh, yes, he was from Greece or sort of around that area, hence the very weird, hard to pronounce name. Uh, but he was one of the fathers of the church. He was only a couple of generations actually removed from Jesus, meaning that he's got a very close line to trace between the guy who spiritually fathered and discipled him to the person who spiritually fathered and discipled that guy was a disciple of Jesus. So close lineage, which is important just in terms of thinking about, you know, how can we trust sort of how these guys think, what they were processing through, all of that stuff. And uh, he is... I'll try not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but he is one of the reasons why we do not all currently profess the heresy of Arianism. So to explain to you guys what that is, Arianism in its simplest form is the idea that Jesus was a created being. Now the issue with Jesus or the Son of God, the Word of God being a created being is that if that's true, he is not actually co-equal with God. Now, I know that's going to start to raise some question marks for you guys, and that's okay. I'm actually really okay with you guys leaving today having questions because that means you are, you're going to have to actually study and go home and learn some stuff and look some stuff up. But uh, at a time where it was very popular in the church to actually profess this, uh, he got exiled by the emperor multiple times for saying, no, this is wrong, no, this is heresy. Jesus is eternally God. He is the Son of God. He is the Word of God who was present with the Father at creation. He, that was the hill that he chose to not literally die on, but he got exiled multiple times and was exiled for over two decades as a result of his standing on that. Okay, so I share all that to say we can trust this guy's orthodoxy. Okay? Uh, you're not going to get exiled multiple times without what you teach, what you write, all of that being under serious review from the other bishops, from the church at that time. And I'm giving you guys all of this lead up for a reason, because I'm going to quote him from his book on the incarnation, on the incarnation, which I would suggest anybody read. Um, it's pretty cheaply available online, and it's actually not a hard read. And if you like sort of delving into that kind of stuff, how many of you guys realize that Scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? So uh, you not considering yourself an intellectual is not an excuse. I'll just leave that right there. Um, he wrote this amazing book on the incarnation, which I'm still working through. But in that, he has this phrase. Now, this phrase is challenging, but it's what's going to head up this discussion about union and I will explain it. So I recognize that what I'm about to say is going to sound a little bit, you know, out of pocket, but I'm going to explain it and explain how it ties into union. He has this phrase in On the Incarnation, and it is this. God became man that man might become God. I felt half of you just tighten up real quick, and that's okay. But let me explain where that's coming from. If you have your Bibles with you, open it up to 2 Peter chapter 1. And as you're doing that, I'll start to just give some differentiation to say what I'm not saying currently. Ah, thank you. My buddy's looking out for me in the front row. <laughs> um, 
what I am not saying, and this is what's been the most helpful for me as I've been studying this and thinking about this, what we're not saying is that the creation is becoming the uncreated creator. So what I'm not saying is that, uh, and what Athanasius is not saying is that we, as we become God, to use his language, as we are experiencing union with God, we are not turning into something that we are not. We are not becoming Yahweh. We are not becoming the uncreated God. We are not becoming people who are worthy of worship, to put that out there. But what we are doing is what Second Peter, or what I should say, what the Holy Spirit is doing in us, what God is doing in us, is differentiated or explained a little bit more in Second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And verse 4 is the clincher here. By these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature. You may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. I've read that a few times before and not uh, realized what was there. And if you've been doing this for any length of time, you know what that's like. So how many of you guys are familiar with the word koinonia, or you've at least heard that thrown around before? So that word has to do, it's a Greek word that has to do with, it's got a sense of like family, co-participation, sharing in, all of that, and it's deeper than just people existing next to each other. It's even a word that's used by Jesus in John 17 to talk about the unity that he wants believers to have with one another, which if you go through John 17, there's, there's a depth of unity and togetherness that he's explaining that he's going after that's more than just, you know, we show up to the same social groups once a week and we just kind of sort of know each other. There's, there's a depth there, something deep, something real, something meaningful, something that transcends even just normal human-to-human -human relationships. That's koinonia. The word koinonia, or I should say a variation of it, is what's used in that word participate. So Peter is saying that what God's inviting us into is to actually have koinonia, that sharing, that fellowship with his divine nature. We're jumping straight into some deep waters today, but are you guys tracking with me? Okay. And here are some reasons why this is good to think about. Uh, this concept of actually sharing in the divine nature, sharing in God's nature, closes so many open loops, at least in my mind, when we look at things in scripture that are supernatural and we agree, we affirm, but when somebody asks you, so how does that actually work or how does that happen? We tend to just scratch our heads and go, I'm, I, I got no answer for you. One of the first ones that I'll turn to is 2 Corinthians 3.17. That was a cue for you to flip there, by the way, so you can do that. <laughs> now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. So when we have this understanding or we start to look at this passage through the lens of what God's actually inviting us into is to share in his nature, all of a sudden that word same starts to actually mean same. If I could put it that way. We're, and Paul in this part of the letter is talking about you know, how we're looking at the glory of God. Like, right, and prior to this, he was talking about how Moses, when he went on top of a mountain and he received the law, he saw God face to face. His, his face was literally shining. Like, his encounter with the glory of the Lord caused 
not just internal, not just emotional changes, but something physical actually happened to his body where he was starting to emit light. And he's talking about, okay, so if that covenant, that old way of relating to the Lord, which he talks about not being anywhere near as glorious as the covenant that we now live in, if that covenant had that measure of glory, how much more what we live in now? And now he's saying, so us with unveiled faces... How many of you guys understand that in the temple prior to when Jesus died, there was a thick, thick, thick veil between where the regular priests were able to serve and where the high priest went, the Holy of Holies. And that was there actually to keep everybody else honestly from dying. We're, we're going somewhere today. I'm going to touch a lot of different things. But when the blood of Jesus came, Scripture tells us that when he died that that veil was torn from top to bottom. The separation that we feel exists between us and God is usually something we put there. So he's saying all of us with unveiled faces are beholding that same image. And I want to even take a second to say, how much work does it take for you to behold something? You're doing it right now. You're looking at me. As we're beholding the glory of the Lord, as we're gazing at Jesus, as we're looking at him, just doing that is actually transforming us. We're being transformed. We're changing from what we were into what Scripture calls a new creation. And we're actually, that glory that we're beholding, it's not just we're becoming something that looks sort of like it. Scripture tells us right here, into, into that same image. So as you're beholding the glory of the Lord, God's glory is actually beginning to come out of you and shine through your life. Because of what he did, because of what he paid for, because of what he's inviting us into. And think about it this way. We know the fruits of the Spirit, yes? You've at least heard it talked about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How do most of us think about manifesting the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? Most of us, it's you need to try harder. I wasn't very patient. I need to work harder to be more patient. I wasn't very loving. I need to work harder to be more loving. So reframe it under this heading. If salvation isn't just about you getting to go to heaven when you die, it's actually about you getting to participate in God's nature and that actually changing you, then manifesting the fruits of the Spirit are, is a result of the union that you share with God, not a result of you trying harder. Now, for some of what I'm sure some of you are thinking, I will address. What I'm not advocating is a type of Christianity where you sit on your laurels and you just sort of say, God's going to do everything. I don't have to cooperate. I don't have to try. He's just going to make it all happen for me. There's Part of what I'm doing here is we're, we're looking at a mystery. We're looking at something that God's inviting us into, saying, hey, this is here. This is real. Let's look at it together. And what happens when you stare into a mystery is you oftentimes come away with more questions than you do answers. Uh, and that seems to track if God's infinite, yes? So if we're looking at something that he set up, then that would make sense that there's multiple facets to it. So what I'm not saying is that in participating in union with God and actually beginning to share in some of his nature, what I'm not saying is that God's never going to ask you to cooperate with him. But what I am saying is that we don't have a father who says, be holy as I am holy, and then doesn't give you the means to do it. Religion is what happens when we try to make that happen on our own. Transformation is what happens when we partner with God who's already wanting to do it in the first place. 
I don't know about you, I've tried religion. I've tried a religious way of doing this. And it typically leads to death. Not typically. It always does. So looking at union and looking at participating in God's nature, us actually being transformed into the image of God, which is more than just you being a replica. There's something deeper going on there. So that doesn't just begin to answer a few questions. It actually reshapes how most of us start to think about the gospel in a beautiful way. I'm going to use, so what I'm about to say is hyperbole, okay? I'm over-exaggerating it for a purpose to illustrate a point. Are we clear? Okay. I, I understand that the stuff that I'm talking about is stuff that can get people really riled up. I love Jesus. I love the word. We're good. Okay? I'll sneak out the back so I don't get stoned later. <laughs> Most of us... Thank you, Holy Spirit. I'll start this way. Most of us look at salvation and the effects of salvation in the way that Martin Luther is quoted as talking about us. Martin Luther talks about the believer as a snow-covered dung heap. The issue with that is that that dung heap never stops being a dung heap. There's zero transformation in that. If your view of the gospel puts your sin as an equal and opposite to God's goodness, you've got a wrong view of the gospel. I'll say it again. If your view of the gospel puts your sin as an equal and opposite to God's goodness, you have a wrong view of the gospel. And how does this all tie in? Because if we start off with an understanding of the gospel being God's just really freaked out, upset, terrified of sin. It's like, oh, I had something so good going and God's getting anxious. And he's like, oh, I have to, he's sort of acting like a dad who has toddlers that messed everything up. And it's like, oh, I got to go clean the house. I got to scrub stuff. I got to like, and we view the gospel as that, like Jesus is coming just so that he can deal with this massive sin problem. And that's it. That's where we stop. We end up with an understanding of the gospel where it's about the Father just making sure you understand how bad you messed up. If the goal of the gospel, though, is union, then sin is the problem in as much as it mars creation and in as much as it creates separation between us and God. And now that starts to make more sense of why Jesus came the way he did. If it was only about a sacrifice needing to be made for sin to be erased, if that's all that it was about, Jesus did not have to come as a baby. He did not have to live 30 years. He did not have to disciple people, then die and then raise. He could have lived a, what we say, and then the question comes like, okay, but he needed to live a perfect and sinless life so that he could be a perfect sacrifice. Yes, he could have gotten dropped onto the earth, lived all of the, however many hours it took for the crucifixion to happen, and he still could have lived a perfect life in that time frame. So then if Jesus is coming to show us the Father, what he's actually like, which scripture talks about in Hebrews. He, he's the express image of the Father. Meaning if you're good with Jesus, but you've got issues with the Father, you're believing lies about the Father. If that's what he's after, and, that's what, and he's after union, now Jesus coming the way that he did, now him living his life, now him coming back, and resurrecting. Because again, if it was only about your sin being blotted out, he didn't have to resurrect the way that he did.
but he's after union. He saw sin and he didn't start freaking out up in heaven, getting anxious and start going, what are we going to do? How am I going to fix this? How am I going to make this work? He saw it and he said, how do I phrase this correctly? The thought in his heart wasn't that anxiety of what am I going to do? The thought in his heart was, I'm going to obliterate this so that they can be in union with me. Because this thing gets in the way of union, I'm going to destroy this. We talk about God hating sin, sin being an offense to God. Have you ever asked the question, why? The, the very easy religious answer is because he's holy. It's like, okay, what does that mean? Most of us can't even answer that question. God's not as easily offendable as we make him out to be. So he hates sin because sin gets in the way of his perfect desire and love and intentions for us. He wants to destroy sin, and he did destroy sin in the cross. Not because, man, I just hate this so much, and I can't believe they would do this, and just harping on that thing, he said, I refuse to live in a world without them. Therefore, sin has to die. I put it this way. I wrote it down, and it was a little bit clearer than me trying to remember it off the top of my head. What we think about the gospel reveals what we believe to be top of the Father's mind when he thinks of us. What we think about the gospel reveals what we believe to be top of the Father's mind when he thinks of us. So to circle back to a point that I made, if the point of the gospel is that you would be free from sin, yes, but that you would just know how bad sin is and how bad you screwed up, then your understanding of how the Father thinks of you is going to be colored through that lens. I really hope they know how bad they messed up. I really hope they understand how good of a gift this is. I, I, like, they need to try harder. They need to cooperate more. I did all this stuff. Man, they just need to... But if your understanding of the gospel is God loved me so much that he said, I refuse to live in a world without them. I refuse to be separated from them. If they choose to be separated, then that's their choice, but it won't be because I didn't take action. If that's your understanding of the gospel, now God is love starts to make more sense. And the version of God that we have when we only view the gospel through the lens of a payment needed to be made for sin, when we only view the gospel through that lens, it starts to invalidate other verses. Like even in the Old Testament where it says, so far as the east is from the west, so far have I separated your sins from you. Because if God's keeping it in front of him and rehearsing it, that's not very separated. And it's not very good news. But a God who wants union with you. A God who wants union with you. That's good news. Another chunk of scripture we're going to look at is John 17, 21. John 17 is this really long prayer that we see Jesus praying to the Father before he goes to get crucified. Uh, how many of you guys are, you know, like, if you want to really know what's on somebody's heart, on somebody's mind, uh, looking at their final words is usually a good test of that, yes? So this is Jesus in the most vulnerable moment of his life, but when he knows he's about to go to the cross, when he know he's, knows he's about to die, he has 
just a little bit of time to talk with his disciples and to talk with the Father. And this, John 17, is what he chooses to talk about. And if you read verse 21, May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. You've heard that before. It's a little mystical, but it sort of makes sense to us. Here's the kicker that, again, ties in with union. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe you sent me. If you want to have fun and get your brain just kind of messed up by Scripture, read all of John 17. And there's all of this language about, you know, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, but I'm in the world, but I'm with Him. And, I'm, and there's all of this back and forth happening. And part of what you start to get is this understanding. is like, okay, Jesus is making it clear in no uncertain terms that He and the Father are one. There's a union there. And then what we just read in verse 21, Jesus is talking to the Father, Father, let them be in me as I'm in you. So salvation isn't just you getting to heaven when you die. It's you getting to participate in the relationship that the Trinity has. Salvation isn't just you getting to heaven when you die. It's you getting to participate in the relationship that the Trinity has. You know what else it says in John 17? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. That means there's a love that Jesus has for us that is without qualification. That the love that's flowing amongst all the members of the Trinity... That's the love that's being poured out on you. That's what that cross back there means. Aaron, this is some cool stuff. Why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because we're going to be spending uh, most of the month of January starting to sort of set the stage, set the tone for some of the things that we're going to be going after this year. Uh, One of the things that the Lord was talking to me about, which I believe is something that we're going to be hitting at some point in our sermon series, is uh, what does it mean to steward the presence of God? What does it mean to be a priest? And so why is this important? Why is union important to talk about in the context of that? Because if you don't have an understanding that the transformation that God's after comes from being un- like being unified with him, then our understanding of stewarding the presence of God becomes, what do I have to do? How many songs do I need to sing? How many tambourines need to be in the room? How qualified of a shofar player do I have to be? <laughs> but... If, if this life is about union with God and loving him out of that place of union, not loving him out of a place of I have to try to love him enough to get myself to a point where I feel like he, where he can start to feel like he made a worthwhile investment. If that's where we start, then being a priest, stewarding the presence of God is as simple as saying, Jesus, here I am. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And here's some more good news about starting to think this way. And again, you'll see this is part one, because I know this raises a bunch of questions. We're going to talk more about this next week. But here's some of the additional good news about this. Um, This actually allows us to rest. This actually starts to teach us how to engage with the light and easy yoke that Jesus talked about. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How many of you guys, if we're being honest with ourselves, we spend a lot of our time agreeing to that mentally, but if we were to be honest with the state of our souls, 
it doesn't feel like that. I'm getting a massive hands up in the back. I appreciate you, Ryan. <laughs> because most of the time we, we, look at the, we look at the gospel, we look at this life that Jesus has invited us into as, cool, I paid your admission, now you need to, you need to earn it. I gave you a spot on the team, prove to me you deserve to be here. Not much grace in there. Not much mercy in that. And not much transformation. You, your discipline is amazing and God asks for it. It will only get you so far. If you only live in the realm of your discipline, then what Martin Luther said starts to make sense. Snow-covered dunghill starts to make sense. But if you start to rest in the fact that what God is doing is actually bringing us into union with him, is actually causing us to participate in his nature, the God who is love, the God who is goodness, then transformation actually starts happening. Then we start to actually do what Romans talks about, where it says that the creation was subjected to futility and it's groaning and eager anticipation for the revealing of the sons of God. When we start to lean into and live into union with God and understanding that transformation flows from that place, we start to actually become the sons and daughters of God that the creation is crying out for. Could go a bunch of other places with this. There's, a tons, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of implications with this. I'll be talking more about that next week. Uh, but if you would please stand. Um, this time I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward, actually. So if you're on the prayer team, could you just start to line up over here? Uh, we talked about a lot today. Uh, and again, you probably are leaving with more questions than answers. But what I do hope and believe you are leaving here with today, one thing is hope and is freedom. Legalism hates talking about union. Legalism hates talking about union. Because legalism is about how can I manipulate God to give me what I want based on the rules that I followed. Union says, you, you, you know what union says? Union is the picture of what the father in the story of the prodigal son said to the older brother, everything I have is already yours. And I know for some of you today, this might actually be the first time you've heard the gospel presented in this way. It might actually be the first time that you've heard the gospel in a way that sounded like good news. And we're gonna create some space for all of us to respond. So Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Your word is true, in you is light, and there is no darkness at all. There's no dark part of you, Jesus. There's no dark part of you. So Father, we lay down what we thought we knew so that we can actually walk into union with you in a deeper way, God. So Father, I ask by your Holy Spirit that you would just begin to cut bonds of legalism from off of the hearts of your people. Would you begin to catch us up, God, into the conversation that we were made for, the conversation that's happening between all the members of the Trinity, the relationship that we were designed for, to be caught up in that. 
So Father, I'm asking for grace, grace, grace to say yes, grace to cooperate, grace to yield. And Father, as we go into a new year, Lord, would you renew our minds? Would you make our minds new again? God, would you shake the old broken ways that we have of thinking about you? Pull us deeper into union, Lord. And with heads bowed and eyes still closed, I just want to give a chance for people to respond. Again, some of you, this might be the first time that you've heard the gospel presented in a way that actually sounds like good news. And so if you need to either recommit your life to Jesus, if you need to give your life to him for the first time, I want you to just slip your hand up at me right now. We want to give you guys time and space here. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we thank you for what you're inviting us into. We thank you that you're inviting us into a new way, which is really an old way of learning how to view this life that you've invited us into, God. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I, I just first want to take a moment. Um, and I actually missed this moment earlier, but I think it's really important. I just want to give honor to a man of God that's in the room. So Levi Gafford is a, a pastor in our city. He's a man of God, comes from Texas, all right? Not that we need no, more Dallas Cowboys fans in this area, but uh, in a state where everyone's running to Texas, he came from Texas to California. Um, so he pastors High Ridge Church. Uh, as beautiful, amazing wife, Monica, was with us early. I just want to say I love you, man. You've been an encouragement to me. Um, but I just want to, I want to pray this over us. Um, just as I was just spending some time with the Lord, I just wrote this prayer down for our house. And I feel like this is a good time. So just hold your, your hands out. I just want to pray a blessing over this church. Lord Jesus, you are strength in our weakness. You are the banner in the war. You are the anchor in the ocean. You are the shelter in the storm. Lord, you justify us and you call us friend. You wrote us in your story the one that never ends. And so may we, as the blood-bought people of God, go so deeply into your promises and summonses, your counsels and encouragements over time, that they dominate our inner lives, capturing our imaginations. And when we receive criticism, may we never be crushed because your love and acceptance of us is so deeply in us. And when we give criticism, may we be gentle and patient because our whole inner world is saturated by a sense of your loving patience and gentleness with us. And now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to make us stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And everyone said, amen.